Welcome to Understanding Islam. This week is episode 6 and we're going to look at ecology and Islamic principles about the environment. Now the situation of the earth and the disruption that's taking place through human interaction, pollution, all these things are well known to everyone, including to Muslim scientists. But let's just refresh our memories we know that the Earth is about 510 million square kilometers in surface area. But of this, only 29%, about 149 million square kilometers, is land. And of this land, only about 70% is fit for agriculture. So we have a clearly limited amount of land that can be used to produce the food that we all need, to produce the places, the environment where we should live and the quality of life that we all want to enjoy. The surface of the earth that's not suitable for agriculture is of course mountain areas, desert areas, areas that are inaccessible. Now, if we think about the population of the Earth, we know already that the population of the world has passed 7 billion people. And there are predictions that talk about it rising to between 8 and 9 billion by the middle of this century. And so it becomes a real question, how are we to feed these people how are we to provide them all with clean and adequate supplies of water? And how are we to dispose of the waste products of these human beings? Now, Islam permits the eating of animals. It is not a vegetarian way of life. And yet Muslim scientists are aware that eating meat and the increased consumption of meat worldwide, especially in those countries that are in the process of developing and are already developed, industrialized, meat eating is one of the least efficient ways of using the land to feed the people. If we think about 40 hectares of land, that's about 100 acres, it takes that much land to feed about 20 people on a meat-based diet for a year. But the same amount of land could feed 100 people on a maize-based diet. Or it could feed 210 people on a wheat-based diet. Or indeed, about 600 people on a diet based on beans. And so we can see that this trend to increased meat eating, so that people are eating meat every day and perhaps twice a day, is having a detrimental effect in terms of the productivity of the earth. It's even more important to remember that this meat production that's taking place in some developed countries in the world requires animal fodder which is being grown in poor underdeveloped countries of the world and so the land that should be used for feeding the local people is being used to grow crops to feed the animals to feed a meat-based diet for the rich people living in richer parts of the world indeed a new development has come in place as well and that is the growing of fuel crops. So turning over vast areas of land to growing crops that will be turned into fuel so that the rich countries of the world will be able to have fuel to power their cars and their other vehicles. 
So this land that could be used to feed the local poor people is being used instead to drive the motor cars of the rich. If we shift the focus to water for a moment, we know that 71% of the Earth's surface, that's 361, square, 361 million square kilometers, is covered by water. But of this water, 98% of it is salt water. Only 1% is ice, and that leaves 1% for fresh water. And it's the fresh water which is needed by human and by animal life and by most vegetable life in order for it to live. So we can see the centrality of water as the source of all life. Now various things are happening with this water. Because of the way that human life has been conducted over the last couple of hundred of years, this water supply has been polluted. It has been polluted through industrial waste, through human sewerage which is pumped into it, through animal and farming waste which is pumped into it. And so something like 1,200 million people on Earth today are having to live with polluted water, water which is not fit for them to drink, but that's all they've got. And they have to wash in it, to cook with it, and to drink with it. This situation of water is actually compounded by the shift of people from the countryside into the city, because obviously you have to pump the water if you want to get it into the cities, and you have to deal with the human sewerage, which is the result of people living a city life. And so you have a, a cross-pollution of the water supply by the sewerage, and therefore the increase in waterborne diseases, the decrease in appropriate water for people to drink. Now this same interaction is seen in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide that we're pumping into the air, the amount of methane from animal and from human waste, and therefore we're seeing a build-up, as we call them, of these greenhouse gases. Going alongside that, we can see that there is an increase every year in the deserts of the earth. They are every year creeping to be a little bit larger. Finally, if we look at the question of forests, we know that millions of hectares of forests are cut down every year and not replaced with trees to plant new forests. Now, this is terribly serious in terms of human health as well. Not only because the forests are the lungs of the earth, absorbing the carbon dioxide and giving out oxygen, but also because a very large percentage of our medicines used by human beings have actually been derived from plant-based substances. And so the loss of this biodiversity, especially in the forests, will have a profound effect. Prophet Muhammad is known to have given several hadith, several of his teachings about trees, about the virtue of planting trees and tending them, and then the reward that will await those people in paradise about planting trees and providing a habitat for animals and for birds and the reward that will come in the time of paradise. And indeed in the rules of engagement in battle in Islam, which go right back to the time of the Quran and the Prophet himself, one of those rules was that the soldiers were not allowed to cut down trees they were not allowed to kill an animal unless it was necessary for their food. So we can see these ecological principles 
coming in in all sorts of ways from the beginning. The Quran tells us that God created this earth and made it accessible for human beings and for all creatures so that we might live here together in a kind of balance, in a kind of harmony. And that the way that we conduct ourselves on this earth will be a test from God. We will be accountable for the way in which we have lived our lives. So the human being then is the abd, the khalifa, the loving servant of God who must obey God in all things, the agent, the regent of God who must cherish the rest of creation and look after it, bring it to its full perfection and repair any harm that has been done within it. Now the whole of creation is there for the common good of all creatures. It is not the personal property of human beings. Human beings are not there to exploit it, but rather to work with it, within it, to maintain this balance, to protect it, to cherish it. It is created in a balance and we are to work within the laws of that balance. And so there is a sense in which the principles of Islamic ecology are drawn from the Quran, from the teaching of the Prophet, and then are worked out by human reason, just like any other Islamic principles. So the idea of consumption, of utility, of doing what suits us best, is in effect a selfishness which is not permissible in Islam. The whole of creation is created not only in a balance, but also in obedience to God. We sometimes call these natural laws. Rivers flow downhill, they obey the law of nature, of gravity. Sunflowers turn toward the sun because they obey the natural God-given way of being a sunflower and exposing the head to as much of the sun's rays as possible. So this natural law then means that the whole creation is originally Muslim. It originally is obedient to God in all things. And anything that goes wrong over time is something perhaps human beings are responsible for it, or perhaps it's something which comes about through the passage of time and human beings have to try to work with it, to correct it, to make it right. There is a hadith of the Prophet in which he talks about the whole of the creation being like one family. And as it is one family, so all the different elements of the family must learn to work with each other for the common good of all. The creation then is not to be abused, but rather it is to be served by human beings as the Khalifa. And the Quran says repeatedly on many occasions that the earth is full of signs, that the person of intelligence and reflection will look at them and will ponder the signs that are contained in nature. So observing the book of nature, learning from it, is one of the fundamental sources of guidance for human beings. Water is one of the fundamental prerequisites for all life on earth. Human beings can't exist more than a very few days without water. Every animal needs water. Therefore, we can think of water as being the source of life itself. When scientists go in quest of other planets, could there be life there? One of the essential things that they look for is, is there any sign of water? Because that is what life needs in order to be able to flourish. Now, how is that water to be used? 
Well, we have a little episode from the time of the prophet which is recounted. There was a man called Saad, and he was making his ablutions for prayer. And the prophet observed him making his ablutions, and he was being very wasteful with the amount of water that he used. And the prophet stopped him and said, What's this? Why are you wasting so much water? And Saad responded, Can there be any wastage with something as important as preparing the ablutions for prayer? And the prophet's response is to say, Yes, indeed, there can, even if you were doing it beside a fast-flowing river. Now, there are several important elements here. Because Saad was not wasting water, He was not wasting water that others had worked to draw. He was using the water for a good cause. And indeed, if he had been doing it beside a fast-flowing river, there would have been copious amounts of water. He's not depriving anybody else of their water. He's not polluting it. He's not causing any harm. And yet the prophet says that this is detestable detestable to waste water even when it is plentiful it is free you are not polluting you're not depriving others and so on but it is detestable to waste this essential quality this essential component of human living and the life of every animal and plant. So water is to be respected. It is not a commodity to be used and therefore to be wasted, but it is to be respected in its own right, even though it may be superabundant, even though it may be your own water on your own land. It must never be used profligately. In the same way, when we come to look at food, we often hear reports of the amount of food that is wasted in developing countries. In some situations, as much as a third of all the food that is produced is actually thrown away unused, either because it's discarded as waste, we cut the bits off that we don't like, or because we cook too much and we throw it away, or we leave it until it goes rotten, or we prepare it, and then people say that they don't like it. So a huge amount of food is wasted. Now the same principle that applied to water can be applied here. Food is not a commodity that if you happen to be rich, you can have as much as you want and it doesn't matter if you waste it. Food is a fundamental element, a component of life on earth. And therefore it is to be respected in its own right and it is not to be wasted or used in a profligate way. Some of our Hindu friends have a a wonderful saying which reminds us of this. They will call food the edible love of God. And you see the way in which it is prepared with great grace and care and it is eaten with dignity and without waste because it is the edible love of God. Now we can apply these principles of water not only to food but to all other natural resources too. And so the profligate use of natural resources, whether it be the oil that we burn up through having cars that consume vast quantities of petrol, or whether it be through our heating or through our air conditioning systems, or any form of waste of the natural resources of the earth comes under the same general principle. These are the creatures of God. They are to be respected. They are not to be wasted. 
Now, a discussion has come up in recent years about genetically modified crops. And Muslim scholars are divided on this question. It's still a work in progress. Some will say that this is fundamentally interfering with the God-given way of nature, just as some Muslim scholars will be opposed to forms of intensive farming, which deprive the animal of the basic God-given rights. Other Muslim scholars will say that as long as the intention is to use these crops to feed the starving peoples of the world, then it is just an accelerated form of breeding and it is a permissible act. And so some dispute on the question, there's not yet a clear Muslim position. Let's take two examples and see how over the centuries Muslim scholars have given guidance on working with the environment around us which can be real indicators of an Islamic understanding of ecology. Let's take land first of all. Muslim scholars have traditionally divided land into three categories. There's developed land. Developed land is that land which is under agricultural cultivation or which is used for human habitation. And so something has been done with it through the interaction of human beings to make it profitable, make it useful in some way to human society. The second category of land is called undeveloped land. And this is land that has never been interacted with in this way. It is, if you like, dead land. And it can then be brought to life through being developed, either being cleared and broken and made fit for crops to grow and therefore cultivated into life, or by being cleared in order that building can take place and it can be a centre of human habitation. So developed land and undeveloped land. The third category is protected land. This is land that is not to be used for cultivation, but instead is protected for the sake of the environment. We can think of this under the concept of green belt, for example, an area around a town or a village in which nature is allowed to conduct its business without human interference. Such protected land around a village could be there in order that emergency fodder could grow, so that in times of hardship, in times of drought, there would be a special reserve of fodder that could be used to feed the animals in that place. It could be common land which is used for grazing of animals on a regular basis. It could be a place where firewood is collected by the people from the village. Such protected land might be in the ownership of the whole village and therefore under the direction of the leader of the village, the headman or the, the leading council of the village, or it could be under individual ownership, in which case it would be the, the landowner who would be responsible for seeing that it was protected and preserved for the benefit of the people and the rest of creation. Not only limited here to people, so we can see protected zones where wild flowers are allowed to grow so that bees will have the appropriate place to harvest nectar in order that they can make honey. We can also see this protected land in the sense of land which has been set aside. 
it may be set aside to have a period of rest before it is used for another purpose. It can also be set aside in terms of common land where everybody is allowed to recreate, to, to go there and to, to go about their business, to do what they want to do there. So we can have these three categories of land and see the way then in which the human being interacts with the land in a balanced way, not only for the sake of human beings, but for the sake of the whole of creation. We've already seen that water can be thought of as the source of all life. And so, not surprisingly, there are Islamic principles in Sharia governing water from the very early times. And you will see that the way that they're developed and thought out shows this sense of justice, of balance, of equity, and of caring for all creatures. So, if we think, first of all, of a large, free-flowing river which runs permanently all year round, then this is free for all people to draw water from it. This is, as it were, God's water, part of God's creation, and all human beings, all animals and plants are free to draw water from it. Human beings are free to dig irrigation channels to pipe that water in order to water their crops. But that water must be protected from pollution. So where we saw the idea of land being protected so that it wouldn't be misused, the land around the water is also protected to stop it being polluted by animal waste or human waste, for example. The same rule applies to the area around a well. People must be able to get to it, there must be free right of access, and animals and other pollutants must be kept away from that water catchment area. Let's take a second example, a smaller river, perhaps a river that doesn't flow all year round, or that flows much more strongly at certain seasons of the year rather than at others. Now, different rules apply, and there must be justice and equity which is worked out according to the use of the water of such a river. If some people upstream take more than they need, more than their fair share, then people downstream are not going to have enough. So there has to be equity and balance between the upstream people and those further down. This equity and balance has to be worked out on the basis not only of all people sharing equally, but also of a share determined by circumstances. What type of soil is in the area? What type of crops are being grown there? What season of the year is it? And so there is a sophisticated way of working out how to share this precious resource with all the people so that all will have their fair share. Now, when it comes to a river, be it permanent or seasonal, then this is a natural flow created by God. But if we think about a canal or a system of irrigation pipes, these are the work of human beings who pipe that water in order to feed their animals or their stock or their uh, plants in order to water their fields. If you have done the work to build the irrigation channel, you then have a right to the water which is the product from it. So unlike a river, if you've worked to develop it, then you have certain rights of access to it. The same would apply with a well. A well which is commonly dug is available for all people to use. 
a well which is dug as a temporary source of water for a camp belongs to that community for as long as that camp is there. But once that camp moves, then it becomes the right of everyone. In the same way, if I were to dig a well on my own private land for my own private use, then I have an exclusive call over that water, unless, of course, there is extreme thirst in the area. And in extremis, then, all human beings have a right, even though it might be my private supply of water, because ultimately water is a gift of God and must be used according to the direction of God. Join me next week when we're going to explore an Islamic understanding of politics. I look forward to seeing you then.